Hi. Um, so great to be live again. And um, we'll give it a couple of seconds just to do um, for people to join us. Um, right. So my name's Yoni Ejo, and I'm really pleased to welcome you to our third session on um, Let's Play development, uh, Developing Relationships Through Play, um, an introduction. And I'm a social worker and an adopter and an adopted person. And I'll let Keely introduce herself too. Hi, folks. Nice to see you again. Um, I'm Keely Craw. Um, I work with children for a long time, about 25 years, but it was really the last 13 years that I've worked as a play therapist. Um, and I've recently just branched out into working with... Uh, women during pregnancy in the postnatal period but um really you know play therapy has been my thing um and if you tune into the last two sessions you know that I really do uh like talking about play um and so hopefully tonight we'll um kind of discuss that a little bit more and thinking about uh how uh children who are, are non-verbal or not very verbal for different reasons um can still access and benefit from play. Brilliant. Thank you, Keely. Um, one of the reasons that we uh, started this um, course is really to, um, because I felt very strongly that um, starting Diversity Adopt, we really needed to give more information to adopters and um, foster carers so they could um, develop some really good and positive relationships with, with young people. So I'm really welcome you here. And if you're here live or um, com coming on as a replay, do just introduce yourself and let us know that um, you're enjoying the session. Um, okay, so that's the, the introductionary bit. So um, over to you, Keely, to talk about nonverbal children. Okay, thanks, Johnny. Yeah, I just feel it's really important just to kind of feel think about um, including nonverbal children in play. So children could be nonverbal for a variety of reasons. Maybe they don't actually have the physical ability uh, to speak. Um, you know, in terms of physiology, maybe um, they have a social or communication disorder like autism, um, where their ability to speak is limited, or maybe they have a selective mutism, or maybe sometimes um, children are just really shy, very anxious, and they just don't want to um, verbalise a lot. So I just wanted to kind of think a little bit about that tonight. Um, and what I was really going to do was just use some case studies of when um, I, I've been a, worked as a play therapist, um, just to kind of show the power of play even with children when they can't uh, or don't want to verbalise. Um, you know, because, it, you know, it, it can really work. And, and sometimes when, we, when we're trying to kind of just get the children to speak, it doesn't work and we can feel like we're just kind of hitting a wall. But I think play can be really useful for that. And also I hope what you would draw from the case studies too is that, you know, different children respond in different ways and we can get different things and learn different things through play with the children. Mm. So the really the aim of um, what Yoni and I are trying to do with this course, these sessions and the 10 module course sort of following the new year is to kind of help you to think about play in terms of how you can develop a relationship. And that could mean lots of different things. So, um, you know, for some children, it might be that, you know, you can use play and it'll work really well and maybe after a period of time they're more open in the verbal communication with you maybe they're just more open to kind of physical contact for other children it might just be you know that you ask them how the day was at, at school and they can say okay and there's two plus mm. points and they had an okay day at school um, <laughs> which might be a biggie you know for some kids yeah. and they were able just to say okay instead of just the silence or the hmm or the nothing. Um, yeah. So um, 
I think you know, also we use a lot of nonverbal communication anyway. I think it's quite a well-known fact now that actually 80% of our communication is nonverbal. So the the facial and body expressions we make give out a lot of mm. communication. And likewise, it's read um, a lot of what we read in other people comes from the nonverbal communication, their body language. So it's really quite powerful anyway, but I think um, now I just want to show it in play. So I also wrote a blog piece on this too. So I'm going to draw a little bit from that, but also take another case study as well. Um, okay. But the first example I'd like to use um, is a boy called Dominic. So he was 17 years old and okay. uh, he lived in a residential care home with other young adults who also had complex um, physical and learning disabilities. And... Um, he wasn't verbal at all. Uh, sadly, uh, as an infant, he had, there's going to be a test, encephalitis. Um, oh, okay. Inflammation of fluid on the brain, and it had, um, mm. it's a virus, and it had left him uh, quite debilitated. He had some physical mobility, uh, but his ability to uh, speak wasn't there. Um, and he came for sessions with me, and, and it was very messy. <laughs> there was a lot of tidying <laughs> up to do afterwards. Um, you know, he liked, he really enjoyed sensory play. Um, and I think probably that's quite where he was anyway in terms of his play. He couldn't mm -hmm. uh, really access like projective play in the way we would. Projective play is like, say, where children get like two farm animals and they're making them talk to each other and um, that kind of play. Oh, okay. Is that what it's called? Projective play. play. So mm -hmm. um, sensory play was probably where he was at. Uh, and he really seemed to enjoy that. But what I noticed was he really enjoyed the the sand tray play. So in play therapy, we use sand trays a lot. There's a wet sand tray where the children can put water in it and they're dry because they have very different qualities and very different feels and you can do different things with them. Um, mm. But he really liked the dry sand play. And there's a lot of burying of things and repositioning of things, which you know can mean something. Um, and I couldn't really accurately say what that meant particularly for him. But what I really mm. noticed was how much he enjoyed the sand. And when I spoke to um, the staff where he worked, they, they just noticed how relaxed actually he felt when he came back from the sessions. And I'd said he really enjoyed the sand and they were a great team and they were really proactive. And so they actually got uh, Dominic a tray and... Um, they, you know, and, and some toys, and he used to play with that. And when his dad came to visit, uh, they would uh, use that. And oh. he just found it really relaxing. And it was, and actually, his dad found it a really good way just to kind of connect and link in with him. So, you know, we, this boy had like no means of uh, verbally communicating, but, you know, he found a way through the sand, through that kind of play. A finer some mm. kind of relaxation and it, it gave the staff and his dad a, a way to kind of and for him really for them to communicate with each other um even though he couldn't really tell a clear story through the sand mm. he benefited mm. greatly from that um, is that quite um a useful thing when um you sort of use play to discover different interests and then replicate those in in different environments is that quite beneficial sometimes yeah uh -huh. i mean i think as a therapist you're trying you're aiming for something different um and and sand tray therapy in itself is quite a powerful tool um but you might just i think it, it's the, i guess one of the takeaway points from this is about looking at your own children and seeing what kind of play they're drawn to um and what they're like and just trying to kind of develop and expand on that notice that and maybe kind of encourage that kind of play more and mm. um, it's definitely a good thing to do so you know if they love building things then you know crack open the duplo or the lego or you know, the right. building or, you know get out all the all the kitchen rolls and stuff you know and you could make you know, exciting things together so that was mm. a real take uh, a way point for me when i worked with that boy um and another boy who I had a great experience with, who again was nonverbal, he was um, autistic, but his diagnosis was quite complex because he'd also had a very kind of neglectful and probably quite very frightening experience as a baby. So he was left 
uh, as a baby for hours on his own in his cot. Uh, and there was also yeah. a lot of domestic violence in the house. So sometimes there it's hard to tease out what parts with the autism and what parts were maybe a disorganised attachment. Um, mm. But there, were, there was autism there. It wasn't all disorganised attachment. Right. You know, I read a lovely boy. He was uh, 12, nearly 13. Um, and when he first came to the sessions, you know, he'd just have a quick look around at things. And I just think as we kind of just, you know, allowed that and allowed that in a space and he felt safe, he started mm. just to... Um, lie on a table just curled up i mean he was quite tall and the, and the table was quite small but he would curl up in a fetal position mm. and i took that as maybe a, a cue that he wanted to be nurtured to have that to be taken right. care of so what i did was actually i put um, a pillow under his head and a blanket on him and he was fine with that and then i just used to sit at the side of him and just sing twinkle twinkle repetitively let me tell you, it's very soporific. I was nearly falling asleep. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> we sit there for like, you know, or lie there, should I say, for quite you know, a long time in this session. We did this week after week, and I was very comfortable with it because I just felt it was really getting something from it. And then mm. I guess it's one of those moments where it maybe it, it felt very powerful for me. But one day we did that, and then he was playing, and he handed me... Um, a key ring out of his pocket. It was just something that um, it had maybe someone in their family had some keys cut and it was just like a little flimsy plastic key ring that they attached to it. And he gave me that and I really took that as a sign actually of, of the the connection that we'd made and that was his way of kind of communicating that and almost a bit of a mm. thank you. And we just kept on um, with the sessions and and after he'd done that he would still kind of dip into that kind of play where he would kind of go to sleep for a little bit have, have a rest he wasn't actually fully asleep but just having a rest mm. um but he, he was also able then to kind of move on to other parts of play as well but when play got maybe quite tiring for him then mm. you know, he must have felt he must have felt very safe and nurtured in that environment yeah i hope so is... and i just think you know, this is also, you know, what I did there is also what, as foster and adoptive parents, you're also trying to achieve too. So all the children that are now in your care have come from spaces that weren't nurturing, that weren't caring. They may have been lucky enough to have a kind teacher or, you know, a grandparent that was kind. So they may have had tastes of that. But this is part of, you know, what you're now trying to establish is, to give the children a sense of what a secure attachment feels like, what nurture feels like, and what it feels like to be safe. And I was able to give um, this boy, Adrian, just a wee taster of that. Um, and I think that really kind of helped him. Again, they kind of noticed changes in his behaviour um, in the school. Unfortunately, oh, wow. home life was still quite um, chaotic. Dad wasn't in the house. He'd, um, he was in prison, but he was about to come out. and Everything just felt a little bit... Um, shaky yeah. uh, and it was just also around the time that I was going to move to Scotland so I never I, I would have loved to have just continued the work with him um, mm. but we did some good work there um, and it was just really interesting uh, just to see you know this child was actually seeking out that kind of sensation and he really enjoyed it and, and he was able to feel safe um, mm. do you think basically. you couldn't are there ways that an adoptive parent or a foster carer can replicate that sort of space, that safe environment that you had therapeutically in their mm -hmm. home? Is that yeah. something that you'd encourage them to do? Yeah. I mean, potentially, Yanni, that could be a whole other course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I guess if you were just going to take some key elements away from that, it, it's about how you kind of provide that nurturing and, and safe space. So it's in those you know, those times when we can be calmer, so like bedtime is always a good one, you know, where, mm -hmm. you know, you can kind of all like, like snuggle up together, you can be reading stories, maybe the children are of an age where they like to like take a drink of milk with them or something, you know, and just, just making them those kind of calm times, maybe just, mm -hmm. you know, be like singing them to sleep, you know, if they'll tolerate that. 
depends how good your voice is, I guess. But <laughs> <laughs> or tapes, maybe for me, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Music. Just something that just kind of just sets that tone. I guess it's almost in some ways for some of these children, it's kind of going back and almost doing a bit like what you would do for a baby. Uh, you know, where night time is about you know the lights are low, you know, mm. there's cuddles, there's milk, um there's maybe like a story or two, a little song and just that very soothing kind of tone. And it just maybe mm. some elements of that can come into the day, um, that can really help, um, just as part of providing that kind of sense of nurture. There's lots of other mm. ways to um but that could just be one I one way to achieve that. Okay. Yeah. Do you think um, when you talk about um, non-verbal cues and, and certainly a lot of young people and children I've worked with sort of struggle to um, read non-verbal signals, mm -hmm. is that an issue that impacts on their play at all? You know, I think sometimes what I've noticed recently is I've just moved into a private practice where I'm working with mums. And so it's and it's all online. So I, there is no real space at the moment to work creatively in ways that I normally would have. So I'm relying a lot more on words. And mm. what I've really just noticed is like, actually, when I was when I'm doing play therapy, how much the play actually talks for me and how much of the okay. communication actually happens through play. And I think that's... Um, one of the great things actually about using play is that it doesn't really rely so much on um, the words but also in the non-verbal communication because almost like the play kind of takes over and takes on a, a voice and a communication of its own so mm. it doesn't necessarily have to be like that kind of reading of the non-verbal cues from you per se because if you just kind of really focus in on the play that will kind of it's like a catalyst really and it does a lot of the work uh, for you and um, so that's why another reason it can be useful certainly um i've worked with and supervised people who you know i've worked with children who just don't look at you all session you know mm. because they're kind of maybe engrossed in the play but also because they just don't know how to manage eye contact or and, and again outside of sessions they'd be probably like getting themselves to bother uh or really struggling because they're struggling to read the non-verbal cues that people mm. uh, but in the playroom uh, that wasn't so much of an issue mm. okay so if i could oh, just that's really interesting. The yeah case study and this is okay a girl again in in scotland um if you're not aware already children's been an extra year in primary school so this girl was 12 and when we first started working mm. together it did feel a bit like um, Last Chance Saloon because I only had so mon many months with her before she moved on to um, secondary school. But she'd actually come from another part of the UK. She was um, her mum and herself and a her brother were fleeing uh, domestic violence um, and they'd moved to Scotland um, and it was very upsetting. And then, you know, these things are never easy to move away from. So... Um, the dad who'd been the perpetrator of the violence had actually followed them in Scotland as well. Um, mm. So it gets very difficult. Um, and this young girl, I'll call her Darcy, um, very quite quiet, quite shy, maybe struggling to interact a little, and they were really worried about how she'd make that transition across to secondary school. So mm. she came to some sessions with me and in the first session, there's a lot of kind of talking about um, what play therapy is, just kind of going through the rules, kind of setting a contract, um, talking about why um, the child was referred. Um, and that was really the only time I got a few words out of her. And when we spoke about the reasons for referral, she'd become a bit tearful. And then we just started working with each other and... I would say we probably managed to squeeze about 12 sessions in. And in every session, there was not a word. <laughs> um, oh, wow. But what she did in every session, because her, her play was the same in every session too, I had a big box of Lego. And she just started in the early sessions. Just it, it just like she was building a, a box, a rectangular box. And it was, but the way it was kind of built and put together, 
it was very loose and things would fall apart. The bricks weren't really overlapping each other to kind of give each other strength. And it was quite a flimsy um, mm. piece. And I just sat, I would just sit and watch her and sometimes reflect. And, and as the um, sessions went on, I noticed actually that the house she was building was getting stronger. So it became more than a box, it became a house. And then she started putting what looked like pieces of furniture in. And then other weeks she was moving that furniture, what I'm calling furniture, around. <laughs> um, right. And I just felt it. When I put my therapeutic hat on and think about that, for me it felt like that kind of piece of Lego was a bit like her. So she mm. was quite flimsy, fragile, vulnerable. And as we kind right. of worked through the sessions, she became stronger. And then all the things inside kind of started to be built. And then she was looking at different permutations of moving that round and, and what layout would be better. And I can say we had to stop because then it was the summer holidays and she was moving on to high school. Mm. But I felt like she'd really wow. achieved something. Can we, we barely said a word. And then about a year later, what was fascinating was I met her just by chance. I just bumped into into the local in the local shopping centre, and what a transformed girl she was and actually she definitely wasn't lost for words then and she'd really <laughs> come on she really flourished um yeah. my mom was with her and she was just saying how well she was doing at school and she was joining in different activities she was really enjoying school she'd made a lot of friends and so I just and I felt you know I'm, I'm sure the school had done a lot and the mom had done a lot too but I also felt just given her that time in the sessions too I'd just given her yeah. time um, just to kind of work things out for herself and because I wasn't pressuring her to talk I think actually that meant a lot to her as well I think mm. you know when children come from backgrounds like that with domestic violence and stuff there's often you know they have to repeat the story a lot and that can be really painful to kind of re mm. go over that and kind of re-experience that trauma again um, and just for it to have that space just to be actually I feel yeah. it's really a powerful experience for her. It certainly sounds like it. it. Sounds like it's quite transformational, and you can see the development um, over the time. And also, you know, domestic violence um, or experiencing that as a child is so loud and traumatic and and jarring. Um, it must have been amazing for her to have that space and that quiet and calm. That's right, and and her mum, as lovely as she was, was a real, as I say here, a real blether. She really liked to talk, so it was probably quite hard. <laughs> Sometimes, so actually, actually, just that chance, actually, to be quiet. But I think actually, sometimes in in all these children's silences, they also spoke volumes as well. Um, mm. So I think they all gave very powerful messages, um, and they all achieved something different. Uh, but they all achieved something that was of value to them and the people around them as well. Mm. It does make you think um, how infrequent it is that you have that space, that quiet, calm space when it's not filled with sort of talking or noise or TV or um, computers and, and stuff. It's quite important to make that space yeah, if, regularly. We're comfortable in a silence, don't we? And we, and we all just like mm. to fill it with some kind of sound, be that our own voice or, you know, turning on mm. the radio. Um, but I think sometimes when, it, I guess it's almost a bit like maybe when you start dating, that uncomfortable mm. silence um, with the other person, you're like, oh, God, what we're going to say? I'm completely drying up. But as you kind of grow and, and develop together and feel safer together, actually those moments of silence don't feel so uncomfortable. Mm. And actually, mm. sometimes it's been quite nice just to sit and just be quiet with each mm. other. And I guess that's just, you know, as the as relationship forms, the awkward and the awkwardness in that silence disappears. Um, mm. and it's quite powerful sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's some really interesting um, situations and, and case studies. Thank you. Mm. Um, you. You asked if, you, if we could revisit one of the questions that we had from last week. Do you want to do that 
yeah, now so before we have a couple of other questions? I think a mom had asked, she had two boys who were age five and six. And when they played it, it started out well. And then they maybe had to, like, it'd lead into teasing. And then maybe the play would get a bit more aggressive. Um, and I'd spoken a little bit about thinking um, you've been kind of creative. So when she saw the boys kind of like veer into some kind of play where it was going to start like going a bit pear shaped and it was going to kind of slip mm. into and in the aggressive side of play just to pause and kind of just reflect and share our observations and then later on I thought you know what I missed a really key piece there that's not only really useful for this scenario but actually it's, it's just a good general uh, guide as well so it was just that um, as well as kind of doing that part about kind of reflecting on what you see just to try and nip that in the bud um, mm. it was also just when the children are doing something really well so when they're playing really well to kind of reflect on that too because it's so important that actually when the children are in the in the moment and and they're doing something good that we can reflect on that so they know actually what it is that is the good behavior as it was um sometimes right. we say to them you know what do you to behave better or something but mm. what does that mean right so if you yeah. can actually pin that down with a real live experience so the boys are playing nicely and they're not teasing each other. They're being mm. cooperative, they're giggling, whatever. You know, say, oh, boys, you're playing so nicely right now. That's lovely. You know, so they get this mm. sense of like, what's good and what's right. And I think that's just a good parenting tip just to use across the board um, when you're trying to encourage um, mm. you know, more positive interactions or a positive behaviour. Um, so I just right. wanted to go back. It just felt like a, I just missed a huge point there. So. No, that's a really good point and, and really important to do it at the time rather than, you know, retrospectively because the child's going to remember and know exactly what you're talking, you know, what situation you're talking about. It's helpful. Thank you. Um, some uh, doctors um, in um, one of our adoption groups um, asked a few questions, a couple of questions. So if I can um, ask you about, um, they were a bit anxious about how to entertain a, um, an 18 month old, perhaps that prefers outdoor play and, and being outside in general, mm -hmm. um, when, you know, obviously, particularly at the moment, you have to be inside quite a bit, or weather means that you have to be inside. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, it's always lovely, isn't it? To, if you, if you, I think some I've heard the phrase "there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothing." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and sometimes it is great fun to go out and jump in puddles, isn't it? But also, you know, you can't be doing it all the time. Um, mm. you know, and if this child is eighteen months old, I'm sure he or she is just full of energy too, and, uh, and quite hard to contain them in the four walls. But I guess if you were just trying to think about things. You know, he really wants to go outside, but it's not possible for whatever reason. Then I wonder just if it could be about bringing some of the outdoors in. So maybe Chris, okay. um, just kind of giving them those kind of alternatives. So it might be just kind of like playing at the sink or getting a bowl and just filling it quite shallowly because of his age. Um, you know, mm. and also the mess that an eighteen-month-old could make. You know, you just put like a cloth down. Um, you know, something wipeable. And then like a, a, a like a a wee bowl with some water and some toys. Uh, you know, maybe you could do that. Uh, maybe it could be okay. um, you know, playing with sand. Gosh, if you were really, really uh brave, maybe a wee bit of salt. <laughs> that would be interesting. <laughs> um, you're know, doing things like making leaf pictures or something. Some of the gives him that. Okay. You know, some of those elements of the outdoors. Um, yeah. Bringing them he's still kind of getting some of those sensations that he maybe enjoys from being outside but kind of uh, pairing that out, um, and bringing it inside so um, he's still having okay. some kind of a, an outdoor experience so and maybe you know Brilliant. picnics picnics on the in the rock in the lounge mm. um, things oh like that's that. fun isn't it uh -huh. yeah right. so just okay. the, the outdoors in the container <laughs> It depends how brave you are and how messy you want want it to be. So. Yeah, 
yeah, <laughs> a little bit contained, maybe. Um, another um, a doctor asked, um, how do you manage a child who wants to dictate everything that you do or say within play? Okay. Uh -huh. So I've certainly met children like this myself, um, mm. and they want to kind of control stuff, and often they've been quite boundary pushing as well. And what I've also often noticed with these children is they're also quite pseudo mature. So older, um, they act older than um, they actually are chronologically. Uh, and it can be quite challenging um, to work mm. with a child like that. And I guess in terms of play, you know, these children who are pseudo mature are, there be, are, are so because one, they've often been put in a position of responsibility. So maybe they've had to care um, mm. for their parents or other siblings or other adults. Um, they've always been the one who's had to sort everything out. And also it leaves them with a sense that adults aren't to be trusted. And if you're gonna, you know, if you're gonna get a job done properly, do it yourself. So they you know, they really kind of struggle to kind of relinquish control. Um because mm -hmm. adults haven't been able to kind of um maintain control well or keep them safe or protect them. So they've taken that role on. And what I've just found in that in that scenario is that I would still kind of um, let them kind of lead in that play. I'd be maybe kind of reflecting on it seems really important that you're in control of this or, mm. you know, that you want to do it this way. I kind of reflect on that a little bit. But I also think that once a safe and kind of nurturing environment is created, that some, you know, it, it can take a while because um, mm. there's a lot to lose um, for the child but they can actually kind of relax into it. And then they will start, I don't think they have to relinquish full control. It's actually about being cooperative, isn't it? But they will kind of allow you in mm. to the play yeah. and they'll allow some of, entertain some of your suggestions as well. Um, maybe not be so kind of controlling or yeah. as dominant. So I think it's just about time and just really just trying to kind of make that kind of feel as safe as possible. So in terms of play, it's like, if you're going to do something, follow through with that and, and do do it. Don't make promises that you can't keep. If you're going to say, we're going to play together at Saturday after lunchtime, mm -hmm. then definitely make sure it's Saturday after lunchtime. It's all those things that actually kind of show a child that you can be uh, trusted and helps and then to kind of take that guard down. Right. Oh, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious of the time. Um, there's a couple more questions which I'm. I think I'm going to ask you next next week. Is that all right? Yeah, <laughs> and um, and um, yeah. Did you want to um, just give a? Let me see. We, we, we've got another session on the 26th of November, which is next Thursday, um, eight. Do you want Keely just to talk about what we'll be covering in those that session? Yeah. So we thought actually that it's quite. Right now, we're all in lockdown, and I know in England there's been more restrictions put in place. And um, where I live in Scotland, we're just about to go into tier four, which is always like a, a full uh, lockdown again. So I felt it would be a good idea just to kind of think about lockdown and how we kind of cope with that, how we help our children to manage that. But I also thought, you know, because it can be quite, uh, it's quite heavy going, isn't it, all this lockdown? Um, situation and all the implications it has I also thought we'd make a chance to be playful as well so we're going to do a do a play activity uh, around items that you would find around the house um so you'll have to stay tuned because we're going to put a photo up uh, before the session and then we're just going to uh, do that too so it's a chance to think about how to kind of cope in lockdown but it's also an opportunity to start thinking playfully as well so we should right. be just with a bit of fun so <laughs> okay well I really look forward to that thank you so much Keely it's been thank lovely you, um, listening to the experiences and um, see you again next week yeah, thank you thank thanks for watching and um, do let us have your comments and um, see you next week thanks bye bye, bye.